Brian is a very experienced and very accomplished trial lawyer. Uh, after graduating uh, with his JD from the University of Oklahoma, his legal ex career is expansive. He's done family law, bankruptcy law, criminal defense, including uh, for low-income defendants as a public defender. And then he was uh, in-house for two major uh, car insurance companies, uh, where he has over 105 jury trials. Uh, he's received numerous uh, awards, including a nomination for the Distinguished Service Award of 2007. And when he was Farmers in-house, he uh, won the uh, 2007 Farmers Trial Horse of the Year for having tried more cases than any other farmers uh, uh, trial lawyer. Now, Brian, did that have a statue of Darth Vader on it when you got there? I'm afraid so. Yeah, yeah. But uh, Brian and I had a number of cases together over the years when he was on the defense side, and, um, and we became friends. And uh, the one case that I had against Brian, I had the pleasure of trying, and he kicked my ass. And uh, so then he switched over to the side of good and mercy and light, and now he's with Gotti Martin, uh, representing the good guys. Uh, and he is a credit to our side of the bar, uh, but it's a personal ego thing. I never got the, a shot at the title again. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, he is a, a very good trial lawyer, uh, excellent lawyer, and uh, welcome, welcome, Brian. Today is our year. Selection with Brian Venture. All right, we are here today to talk about Vordier on parts of the world, Vaudier in other parts of the world, jury selection everywhere. We start off with some assumptions. Some of those assumptions are right in life, and some of them are wrong. There's some assumptions I've been working with for years on jurors. Probably not going to come as a real big shock that I've assumed for years that a juror would rather be elsewhere than listening to me. So we did a little bit of an uh, experiment. Open that up, give me your honest reaction. Here's the first envelope. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it looks like a jury summons. Um, it is a jury summons. Oh boy. <laughs> oh, that sucks. <laughs> if I thought it was me, my, my first reaction would be, uh oh. <laughs> How about you? Uh, yeah, same thing. Same thing. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't, I, I don't, I don't. I don't think so. So why don't you like jury summons? Well, I just don't. I don't like to do it, but it has to be done. What do you think about when you get one of those? Um, try to find the way to get out of it. <laughs> uh, not particularly happy. Usually I'm so busy with work that to take the time off work to go go sit for hours and then to not even be picked for anything, you know, it just feels like a, a big waste of time. I would hate to decide someone's future. I don't know. I don't want that put on me. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, if it's people that want to go, you know, by all means, but you're going to force people to go. Yeah, I don't like that at all. <laughs> I mean, it's patriotic duty. I mean, is that not the response that you want? No, no, I want your honest with you. Yeah, no, that is my honest response. Have you ever served on a jury before? Yes. Uh, what was that experience like? Time consuming. Um, kind of fascinating because it was a, a mental capacity jury trial. And so we had to decide if this dude was ready for, was competent to stand trial. Was he? Uh, yeah. <laughs> It stinks because I'm gonna get a little bit behind at work, but at the same time, I mean that's the duty. And I'm, that's I didn't serve in the military, so this is how I can serve my country in one way. Small, but open this envelope. I'll take okay. that one back. Okay. Come on, chick. Oh yeah, five bucks. Now this I'm with. I get to keep this, right? Yes, you do. Awesome. Five dollars. 
That's much better. <laughs> All right. I'd be like, hey, a free five dollars. And, and it is. <laughs> I like this one too. Um, I don't. I don't know what this is. Is it better than a jury summons? Yes. Okay. <laughs> it's yours, key? No. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You know Thank one? you. You're yeah. welcome. I like that one. It looks real. It is real and it's yours. Okay. Thank you. For Thank you so favorite. much. All right. So I've been assuming for the last 16 or 17 years as I put jurors in a box that they would rather have opened up an envelope with money in it than a jury summons. And we went out and very shockingly proved that that was a correct assumption. So what does that tell us? Well, the stand-up comedians and the writers of this world who uh, make jokes about how the jurors are folks that would rather be not, you know, not be in your room and not be listening to you, there's something to that. So what does that mean? Well, that means that a jury may not be what we all think of it as. There's a castle up here. You may be wondering why. Let's put the next one up there. Princess Bride fan, anyone? Obviously, we got one here. All right, have fun storming the castle, is what they say as they're leaving here. If you do it right, if you get this group of jurors who got that summons and didn't get that check, they come in with a certain attitude. Now, lots of us go in and we try to change their mind, change their attitude, change the way they feel. Do we have enough time to do that, do you think? How many of you guys are trying cases where they give you unlimited voir dire? It's pretty rare. We fight tooth and nail to get every second that we can in voir dire, but the reality is you're not going to change people's minds in 30 minutes or an hour or even in a, a half a day or a day. It's not going to happen. So you can waste your time and try to change their mind. Or you can take their, their ire, their anger, their a little bit miffed. They didn't get that five bucks. They got that jury summons. <clears throat> can you make them be happy about it? I'm telling you right now, after, and it's gone up a little bit, after 129 now jury trials, I can't change their attitude from angry to happy. But what we can do, and in a properly done voir dire, ideally what we will do, go to the next one, so we'll form a lynch mob. What we want is this jury to realize what they actually are. For the very first time in their life, a lot of them, are able to make a decision that will actually change their lives, actually change their community, actually change how people operate in their community. If you can get that jury's eh, annoyance and irritation redirected at the rule breaker, who caused you all to be here happened to have hurt poor, pitiful Polly Plaintiff. Could have hurt anybody in this room, could have hurt anybody that you love, that you care about. Because that juror who's a little irritated and walks in there a little annoyed, and the first person they hear is some smarmy plaintiff's trial attorney. Got any of those? First person they hear from is the jerk that filed the lawsuit. Anybody have to overcome that? All right. You can't overcome it. It's impossible. We're in Texas. We're in the South. We're in places where the tort reform has gotten a hold of us, right? You can't do it. But what you can do is redirect that ire where it belongs. Let that jury know that the reason we're all here is because of that jerk sitting over at the other table, not poor pitiful plaintiff. And don't focus too much on the plaintiff. John McClain, anyone recognize him? All right, reason this one's up here, when we are putting together, our, and this goes beyond Vordire, but it's important and it starts with Vordire. When we're putting together our story, what we as plaintiff's attorneys too often do is focus too much on poor pitiful plaintiff. Eh -eh, that's no good. What jurors like, what they crave, what they desire is what Hollywood gives them a story. And who is John McClain without Hans Gruber, one of my favorite villains, my second favorite villain actually. You're going to see my favorite here in just one second. That story is a fantastic story. Everyone in here I'm sure has seen that movie. Everyone knows that story. But if you don't have a compelling bad guy in your story, you've just got another cop movie. Okay? Let's go to the next one. Favorite, 
favorite bad guy of all time. This was me, by the way. When I played defense, that's the way I thought of myself. I really, truly did. Um, and and it, it got to wear on me after a while. It got to where I, I didn't want to be Darth Vader. It, it sucked. It's easy to be Darth Vader, especially in this area of the world. You go in and you take advantage of those, uh, those tort reform jurors and you sit back and you just poke a hole and you feel really good about yourself because you win and then you start going and thinking about, am I doing the right thing? And then you end up, five years later, you're in front of an audience of folks like this. But the point of this is Luke Skywalker He's just some farm boy from Tatooine. Not really all that interesting until you have a compelling bad guy. So, who's the real star of these shows? The real star of these shows isn't the good guy or the bad guy. It's the story. And we've got to get that established early. So when we're focusing our efforts, focus on giving them a story. Let's go to the next one. Now, this jury this group of people that you're going to let know have the ability to write things down on a piece of paper at the end of this process that will make their world either safer if they agree with you or less safe if they agree with the defense. That lynch mob mentality is this is where we want it to come to. We want these folks to get together and feel good about writing down big numbers on your verdict form. All right, so next one. So, when these folks come in, we've already found out from going and talking to them in the Clyde Warren Park exactly how they feel. Well, what's their experience? What do they come up thinking and knowing about the judicial system? Very often, it's only what they see on TV or see in the movies. So, what does Hollywood think about jurors? We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant... Now, all those voting guilty... Please raise your hands. The juries are made up of 12 people who are so dumb they couldn't even think up an excuse to get out of jury duty. I'm just proud to be a part of the American judicial system. Dump them. While you're at it, let's get rid of number four and six. And I'd say lose number 12, except the prosecutor's gonna fuck up and do it for us. Yes, I'd like to bring something to the court's attention. Trials are too important to be left up to juries. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the... I, I didn't get that last bit. What was it attributed to? <clears throat> Jury! Um... But today, you are the law. You are the law. We accept this jury. Order! Order! You're out of order! You're out of order! I was so happy to be picked for jury duty. It's like watching court TV, except I'm in the TV. Guilty. 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 Not guilty. If we are to have faith in justice, We need only to believe in ourselves and act with justice. Some of your jurors may have seen some of those movies. All of your jurors have seen at least a portion of some of those movies. And a jury, in, in my mind, is a very special thing. It's a living, breathing entity that, depending on the size of your jury, either has six mouths and 12 ears and 12 eyes, or double that if we're in district court. They have this kind of a collective wisdom, this, and it's not always wise, but this collective uh, mind speak or mind think that sometimes they'll get back there and, and they'll do amazing things. Sometimes that will just absolutely kill your case and sometimes it will absolutely just make your case. But when, you, when you're talking to your jury, realize that they don't all have to have seen these movies. They don't all have to have heard these stories. Find cultural common points that are going to be at least somewhat knowledgeable for some of them. If any of them go back there with that knowledge that you want them to go back with, they can infect the rest of the group. And that's a very, very important thing. And you can get a lot of mileage out of that. All right, so for this next section, what we're going to actually do is I'm going to go through probably about the first however much time we have left, 10 or 12 minutes. 
or 15, uh, of the way that I actually conduct voir dire on a car wreck case. So what we're going to do is Ken's got a portable microphone right here, and we're going to make the first three, is it these three here? All right, so these first three tables here are going to be our veneer, our potential jurors, and I would like for you guys to answer honestly from your own experiences as best you can. Um, try not to screw me, <laughs> Gary. All right, so everyone can participate, but the show of hands, I want to, these first three tables, you know, think about it yourselves back there, but so everyone can see, I'd like just for these first three tables to, uh, by show of hands, answer some of these questions. And this is very important. When you are talking to a jury, in, especially in, in Texas. I don't know if we got any non-Texas attorneys here, but around here, we've got to be extremely efficient with our time. So get used to having them hold their hands up. Ideally, uh, a lot of the judges will give them a card with a number. You need to have somebody, while you're up here talking to the jury, if at all possible, you need to have somebody sitting next to you with a chart because they're going to be able to see things you can't see because when I'm sitting over here looking at you and concentrating on you, I can't see Jason giving me a snarly face, but she might be able to, okay? That's important. Also, it's just impossible for us to have a good a communication with these people if I'm always doing this, okay? So, so let somebody else take care of that part of it. All right, here we go. We're in the box. We've been sworn in. We're all swearing to tell the truth, right? First three rows, swear to tell the truth. Fair enough. Your lawyer, so I'll just take it as a uh, close enough. By show of hands at these first three tables, who here wants to create a safer society moving forward? All right. By show of hands at these first three tables, who here would prefer a less safe society? No takers? Not even one? And I'm going to go out of character just for a minute. I'm standing here, and this is physically important. When I make my points, I want to find a spot in the room that is the spot of integrity, okay? When I'm talking to you about building a safer world, when I'm talking to you about the things that are important for our case, I'm going to stand in the spot of integrity. So you would really prefer a safer world rather than a less safe world, sir? Yes, sir. All right. There's certain folks out there that don't think it's a big deal when somebody gets hurt. They don't think it's a big deal or a problem when someone in society has harms or losses that come to them. We're going to talk about how that might make us feel. When I move away from my spot, when I want to talk about their spots, their positions, go stand over in a different spot. I don't know what to call that spot. I, nothing that I can say politely, and I'm on camera right now. But stand in the position of integrity, physically, literally, as well as you know, emotionally, whenever you are talking. And when you're making the defense's points that you're about to tell them why they don't matter, go somewhere else. Go stand somewhere else in the courtroom. When you're asking scale questions, stand at one end of the jury box. For, this, for the one end of the scale. Go over and ask at the other end. I may do a little bit less of that than normal due to our acoustics here, but I think it's an important point. So we've asked, by show of hands, who prefers a less safe society? We get no takers. Congratulations then. You guys are actually in a place, whether you knew it or not when you got that card, you're actually in a place where you can have a real effect on whether your world is a safer world moving forward or whether it's a less safe world moving forward. Juror number 10, how do you feel about that, sir? I like the safer world. And how do you feel about having a say in it yourself? Sounds good to me. All right. The reason I ask you that, sir, is some people just have a problem. They just have something in, internally that they can't sit in judgment of someone else, that they're just uncomfortable. And so I'm going to ask this next question. Is there anybody here who just cannot sit in judgment? Not, not amongst you guys, of course. <laughs> All right. So, while you may not have realized it, by coming down here, by doing your civic duty, and we recognize that it's a duty, this is a burden we've placed on you. We need your help. We need your help to make the system run properly. And when you came down here, you are now a participant in the justice system. We're going to present a case to you. I can't get into the facts right now, but we feel like we have a just case. And at the end of the day, you're going to be asked some questions. The answers to those questions is going to change the world you live in for the better or for the worse. 
If I had time, better go over here for worse. Can we all agree here that it's a safer society whenever we put robbers, murderers, and rapists behind bars? All right. Would anyone be surprised to learn that there's actually 10 times more people hurt every day due to someone violating a safety rule than there are from violent crime? Did anyone know that besides me? Generally pretty surprising. Now that you've found that out, how does that make you feel? Linda, who is, I'm vamping for time. I'm shocked. Okay. I'm surprised. Do you think that now that you have that knowledge, does it change your idea or your attitude a little bit when you hear someone say, well, it's just a civil case, it's just a safety case? Yeah. Okay, and in what way, ma'am? Well, I didn't realize the numbers for that, that part. Would you agree with my notion then that if there's 10 times more people hurt due to these civil safety violations than there are criminal case, that we should be 10 times more careful? Yes. Does anyone else agree with that notion that if there's 10 times more harm, we should be 10 times more careful? All right, anyone disagree with that notion? Can we all agree that if we hold big companies responsible when they violate safety rules that we have a safer society. Got the car? Anybody here ever hear of this car before? Yeah. Got a Ford Pinto up there. Think we can go out and buy a 2016 model? Mr. Arsenault, do you think we can? Does anybody in this room, and of course you guys are lawyers, pretend you're not for the moment, does anybody know why we can't go buy a 2016 model Ford Pinto? Inherently dangerous. And uh, do you happen to know why they're inherently dangerous, sir? They um, would explode when they're hit. Um, as a matter of fact, people not unlike you came into a room just exactly like this in the 1970s and they stood up against Ford Motor Company and they told them that you are not allowed to make such a shoddy, a shoddy piece of material in our, I'm trying to be polite here, <laughs> uh, a, a, a shoddy piece of workmanship into our community. What actually, real specifically for those of you that don't know, was going on is Ford was in the process during the late 1970s of trying to compete with the incoming Japanese cars. Uh, Japanese market came in with better made, more efficient vehicles, and Ford, being the magnanimous people that they are, they, what did they do? Did they just build a better car and compete in the marketplace? Heck no, they built a cheaper car to compete in the marketplace. How was it cheap? In this particular instance, the particular problem is they decided to save some money by sticking a really weak gas tank in front of a really weak rear bumper that had bolts that extended through the bumper. Those bolts would go into the gas tank at a very low speed and would often cause these sort of fireballs. Does anyone in this jury think that Ford quit making those out of the goodness of their heart? Do you have an opinion as to why Ford might have stopped making that car? Because they probably had to pay so much money after a result of lawsuits that it became economically unfeasible. That's exactly right. And what I'm going to ask you as a follow-up, hold on a second, Ken. What I'm going to ask you as a follow-up is, if you are selected as a juror on a case where you've got to stand up against a billion-dollar company like this, do you have the courage to do that? Yes. All right, and you feel confident in that? 100%. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. How many of you guys drove up here today? All right. Now, I'm, I ask a question, and it's, it's one of those scale questions. Who feels safer driving today than they did 20 years ago? Okay. Who felt safer driving 20 years ago than they do today? Uh, those of you who said today. Safer today. Safer today. If you feel safer today, why do you feel safer on the roads today, sir? Technology. What do, what do you mean by that? Airbags, seatbelts. The way cars are made. All right, thank you so much. 
Now, 20 years ago, maybe even 30, 40 years ago, we might not have had all those safety features, correct? Right. All right. Uh, amongst those who selected that they felt safer 20 years ago, Ron? Yes, sir. Uh, why is it that you felt safer 20 years ago? Make sure you get right on that mic. Uh, volume of traffic. Uh, speed limits were probably better enforced. Uh, 70 meant 75 back then, and that means whatever. Uh, the condition of the roads, the infrastructure problems that we have now, uh, roads were really better, I believe, 20 years ago. Thank you so much. I appreciate that, sir. Who saw this as they were driving down here today? Pretend I have my phone, which is over there. Anybody see that? Raise your hand if you saw that today coming in. And a matter of fact, you saw it more than once, didn't you, sir? All the time. You probably saw it five. You, you saw it as many times as you looked for it, didn't you? Is that right? Uh, yes. Now. It's amazing how many people are doing something else than driving. <laughs> and what are they doing whenever they're letting their mind get away from the road? Distraction. All right. Do you think distracted driving is a problem in our society? Absolutely. Would you like to be in a place where you could do something about it? Yes. Congratulations. Is anybody going to have a problem, going to have a hesitation, going to have any issue at all with standing up and doing exactly what juror number four did? Any issues at all? All right, wonderful, wonderful. Can we all agree to base our decision today only on the facts that are presented to you here today and the arguments that are presented to you today. And what I mean by that, and that seems an obvious question, what I mean by that is, are we going to allow outside influences, things we've heard on the television, things that we've heard from politicians, things that we may have heard from friends and family at church, are we going to allow anything, concerns about how much a gallon of milk might cost after this verdict, concerns about anything along those lines are not something we're allowed to take into consideration here. Is anyone going to bring any of those outside factors into the, this courtroom? Any concerns about, well, if I put down a big verdict here, if the facts support it, people might be concerned about me. I might have to defend myself. Any of those kind of concerns. Now, we don't have that in this room, but you would be shocked how often you end up getting answers. Oh, yeah, there's a lot of tort reform folks out there in North Texas, South Texas and everywhere else around, I'm sure. But where I generally tend to practice, we'll get about a quarter of the room, they'll have something. And when you ask those folks what their issue is, what do you think they usually say? What do they say to you? When they're worried about these outside factors, when they're worried about people finding out that they were involved in a big verdict, what, what, what's, when you ask them about those things, what's, it's tort reform stuff, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna get help, you know? Hey, I'm one of those run-brain verdicts just giving away money. Right. right, And that's, that's invariably what I hear as well. You know, well, I don't mind being a part of a verdict, but I don't want to be involved in one of these big verdicts, right? They all have a concern about that. Well, you got to give them permission to write that big verdict. And that's why I'm saying, even though we're just, we're just going down my list of questions and we're just asking questions in voir dire to find out ostensibly, do these folks have a dog in this fight and that sort of thing. The reality is what we're trying to do is identify those folks that are so tort reformed they're gonna be bad jurors for you and they'll let, them, they'll let themselves be revealed throughout the course of these questions and we're also going to want to find someone who has a problem similar to what our, what our client has. In the circumstance that we're pretending to try today, I've got a rear ender where someone's got a minor head injury. Okay, so I'm gonna ask, has anyone in this courtroom been involved in a motor vehicle accident in which they or a close family member received a blow to the head. All right. Uh, can you tell us what happened in that circumstance? I was rear-ended and got whiplash. I had hit back against my, uh, against my headrest and rang my bell pretty good. Did you have any experience with either concussions or with uh, whiplash or spinal injuries or, or closed head injuries before that happened? No. How would you feel if someone had come along and said, well, it was okay to have done that to you because you may have had that problem in the past? Not good at all, not at all. Okay. Pull the defense's teeth. 
When you find somebody in the jury who has similar issues to what your client has, ask them how they got it. If you're lucky, they got it in a similar manner to your client. I got rear-ended at a red light, my head goes back and hits the, the headrest. Did you ever have headaches before that? And that was sure, everybody does. How would you feel if someone then says to you, well, you didn't really get a concussion because you had had headaches in the past? How does that make you feel? They're calling me a liar. Okay, now, in your circumstance, as we sit here, you were sworn to tell the truth today, weren't you? Correct. Guess what, just like they're gonna be. You didn't ask for that to happen to you? No, I did not. All right, was there anything you could have done to have avoided that? No. All right. Now, is there anybody here who, before they heard that story or before they had personal experience, was skeptical about things such as whiplash or concussions? Yes, you, sir. <laughs> sure. Mr. McGilbert, um, you had told us previously, work, work, work with us here, folks. You had heard, uh, told us previously that before you actually were rear-ended, you didn't even think that whiplash was a real thing. Is that what you told us? And after your uh, motor vehicle accident, uh, how'd you feel about it? How did I feel after my motor vehicle accident? Yes, sir. Um, that is real. And did it take that personal experience for you to believe that it was real? Uh, yeah, because I just hear so many stories of people trying to get money out of, out of accidents. Right. Now, to go back to what juror number two had said earlier, and, and just to apply across the board, to any injury, any problem that you've ever had in your own life that was caused by somebody else, would you rather have had $1,000 or would you rather have never had that concussion? Never had that concussion, for sure. Well, how about if I change it to 10,000 or 100,000 or a million? We're getting close. Okay. So there's a figure that you personally would trade the integrity of your body for money. Is that what you're telling us? I don't like it the way it sounded like you just called me a hooker. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's try it another way. Would you agree that there is a figure that you would voluntarily go through a certain amount of pain in exchange for that? Something small, like a headache, concussion that I recovered fully from? Sure. Right. How about a permanent injury that just doesn't ever go away? What? Like, let's say that headache that you experienced for about six weeks, it just never, ever goes away. Those memory problems that you had for six weeks never, ever go away. Is there any amount of money you would take in exchange for that? No. Does anyone think that she would voluntarily go out and do this? And the reason why you want to do this, this person here, this juror, is in the same shape that you're in, that you're in, that you're in, that everybody's in. They got drugged down here just like the rest of you. If you can find someone in that audience who's been through something similar to your client, ask them how they handled it. Invariably, they put in an insurance claim, the claim got resolved, right? If they didn't get it resolved, would you have come down and availed yourself to the court system? And I know who you are, so you're going to say yes. Most people will say yes. And then you turn to one of the other jurors and say, does anybody have a problem? Does anyone hold it against juror number two that she would avail herself to the court system? This is another opportunity, to a sneaky way to find out about those tort reform jurors that you're not going to be able to get rid of. You can often, once you identify them, ask them a few questions to get them to out themselves so that you don't have to burn up your peremptories on them. How are we on time now? We don't have time to go through the full thing. Um, you know, brief period of time that they give us, it still is a little bit longer than this. But, I want to finish off, I finish off all of these with various, we call them wolf speeches. You see why. Um, you have heard already today from a couple of great trial lawyers. I, I was up here, I actually was hiding back there when uh, Shelly and Pat were up here just killing it and doing a great job. Um, you probably, at least some of the younger ones and maybe some of the older folks in the room, you're probably sitting here listening to what you've heard today so far, which you'll continue to hear over the rest of the course of this presentation and what you hear in all these CLEs and if you're anything like me and anything like everyone I've ever met whether you want to admit it or not 
you are familiar with the parable of the two wolves. It's an old Indian tale. At least it was told to me by an old Indian. Inside of each of us, there are two wolves. And in this circumstance, there is a timid wolf. And we've all seen that in dogs. Dogs are just domesticated wolves. There is the wolf inside you that wants to cower away, that does not want to get up and speak in front of 100 people because you might mess up and embarrass yourself. And then there's that other wolf, the alpha. <clears throat> you know what I'm talking about. There's two wolves in each of us. And if you want to be the kind of wolf that the insurance company fears, then you've got to be the alpha. And the tale goes, we all have two wolves battling. And it will battle for the rest of your life. And the question each of us has to ask, which wolf wins the battle? The one that you feed. And you feed them by coming to things like this. You feed them by visiting with great trial lawyers. You feed them by getting second chair help from people who've been there before. If these things that I'm talking about, this warrior spirit comes natural, congratulations. If it doesn't, find someone who that does come naturally, buddy up with them. Learn from them. We're all here to learn to try to get better together. Okay? Thank you all very much. I appreciate your time. Hunger strikes. And you're getting rid of the folks that just aren't going to go. Do you have some topics that you typically cover to strike folks? Or? I've act Um, with regard to strikes, I've actually, oh, and by the way, to the extent you guys liked any of that, it was stolen from smarter people than me in this room. Uh, to the extent it sucked, that's all me. Um, and, and I'm going to steal again right here, but I'm usually pretty good about giving credit. So to, in order to figure out, and this is towards the end, it's, it's actually my, what does that say, final question. And it also says, my Kindman's question. Who would have a problem holding us only to our minimal burden of the preponderance of the evidence? And I go through a deal when we've got more time to where I use my hands as the scales of justice and I let everybody know that in a civil case I have only to tip the scales ever so slightly. And what I do is when I say that and I do that I talk about how the preponderance is only more likely true than false. And so when you use that scale all the time and you're asking folks you going to let me win by this scale? Yep. You going to let me win uh, medical, you know, medical by this scale? Yep. You going to let me win pain and suffering by this scale? <laughs> That's where you find out who you who you got to get rid of. And if you got a bad case that you need to bust the panel on, there's a that's a panel busting question right there. So if you feel like you've got a good case and you don't want to bust them, be careful with that. But that's the way I approach the strikes is I, I let them out themselves. And other than that, I, I look for people that looked at me mean. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Brian. Appreciate you. Thanks.